So what we're going to do today, I'm just going to cover a few basics of bee biology and behavior, and then I'm going to do some miscellaneous topics like swarming, pest and diseases, and hive equipment. And then I'm going to just answer any questions that anyone may have. You can put your questions in the chat at any time during the speech. And we have Matt, Matt Kaiser here, my dad. He's going to be monitoring the chat and reading out y'all's questions. And at the end of each slide, I'm gonna put up a slide deck. And at the end of each slide, we're gonna go over some questions. So that will be the format today. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. So I'm gonna start out by talking about some bee biology. You probably know already that there are three types of bees, the queens, workers, and drones. So starting out with the queen, probably the most important bee in the hive, there's one queen per hive, and her job is to lay all of the eggs that will develop into bees. She is the only egg-laying female in the hive, the only female capable of laying eggs, and she can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day. She'll just walk around on the comb looking for open cells and looking for a place to lay her eggs. Also, about the queen, you've probably heard that bees can only sting once and then they die. That's actually not true with queens. A queen has a straight stinger instead of a barbed stinger. And so the stinger will not stick in someone, a, a human or animal flesh. So the queen can sting as many times as she wants to, but queens usually don't sting. They're very docile. They usually just do their job and rely on the other bees in the hive to protect them. So I have actually never heard of anyone being stung by a queen bee, even beekeepers. The queen has a very long lifespan. She can live up to four years in the wild. In captivity, she's usually replaced every year or so by beekeepers. And, but in comparison, worker bees only live around six weeks. So the queen has the longest lifespan of any bees. I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to move on and talk about drones. Drones make up around 10 to 15% of the hive in peak season in the summer. They are the only male bees in the hive, and basically they really do not have a job. They're very lazy. They just basically sit around all day, taking up the food resources. Typical guy, right? Um, so, but I guess they technically have a job because drones obviously have to mate with the queen. They have a special way of doing that. Around two o'clock in the afternoon every day, they will leave the hive and go to a drone congregation area, just a special area where all of the drones will come together. No one really knows how they know where those areas are, but they will just make a specific, like a lot of them will gather in a cloud in one place. And then unmated queens will fly out of their hive to the drone congregation areas, mate with around 10 to 15 drones who then die and go back to her hive. And she will never leave the hive again. So the drones, Actually, their life cycle is a little different than the workers and queens because they are born in the spring, usually. They survive through the summer. If they mate, as mentioned, they die. If they do not mate, they are usually kicked out of the hive by the workers. So they will die in the winter. So you'll usually only see drones in your hive in the summer and spring. Drones? cannot sting, they have no stinger. So actually a 
really cool thing to do once you get a little bit comfortable with being able to tell which is a drone, which I'll explain in a second. You can actually hold a drone in your hand without worrying about it stinging you. And that is a lot of fun. So um, how do you tell a drone and a queen and a worker apart? Well, the drone here is larger than most bees and very round, fat, bulky, and has very large eyes. You can see on this picture his eyes meet at the top of his head and are very large in comparison, in proportion to the rest of him. So that's the main identifier for a drone. I'm actually going to back up to the last slide for a second to tell you how to to tell you how to identify the queen because I forgot about that part. Um, there we go. So the queen is also bigger than the rest of the bees, but the difference is her abdomen is really long. She, you saw how the drone was round. She's a very long bee. And you can tell her abdomen takes up most of her body length. Also, another point about queen identification, beekeepers will usually mark her with paint. So she'll have a little dot on her back if you buy an already marked queen. The color varies by year. This year's queens will be marked in blue. So that is how to identify drones and queens. And now moving on to talk about the worker. Workers are the smallest bees, much smaller than queens and drones. They make up the vast majority of a hive, around 80 to 90%, depending on the season and other things. All worker bees are female, but they cannot lay eggs because the queen actually has a pheromone that prevents the worker bees from developing further. So they are female bees, but cannot reproduce. Worker bees can sting, but they can only sting once because they have a barbed stinger that will lodge in mammal flesh. And when they try to pull away, their stinger will separate from their body and then they die. So the workers will defend the hive by stinging, but once they sting, they die. As their name implies, workers do all of the work of maintaining a hive. So they get the, gather the resources, feed the developing bees, um, clean the hive, take care of the hive in general, defend the hive, Basically, they do everything except for the egg laying. I'm going to talk in more detail about that, but first I want to stop and see if we have any questions. Do we have any questions? None so far. Okay. Well, what are the jobs of a worker? This is based on age. So just like a child growing up might have different responsibilities as they get older. The same thing applies to bees. As they develop, they get more and more advanced jobs. They, when a bee first emerges, the first thing she does is clean her own cell out, take out the debris, dirt, whatever got in there. And then she'll start her job immediately of cleaning other cells. She's called a cleaner bee or hygienic bee. They, these bees are responsible for taking debris out of the hive, dead bees, um, just cleaning it up, keeping it hygienic. You might think, or some people might think bees are dirty because they're insects. They're actually very clean creatures. Their hive is basically sterile, spotless. It's very interesting actually how clean they are. So after, the bee grows up a little, develops a little. She'll become a nurse bee. And these bees are in charge of feeding all of the developing larvae. 
and they feed them with a special food that comes out of glands in their head called royal jelly for up to three days if it's worker brood. After that, they get bee bread, which is a mixture of pollen and nectar, and honey made from nectar. Queen bees are only ever fed royal jelly. That's actually what makes them develop into queens. But the nurse bees will, that's their job. They will feed all of these bees developing. After that, when they get a little older, they become attendant or queen court bees. Um, you can see in this third picture here, how all of these bees are in a circle around the queen in the middle here. That's the queen, that's all of the attendant bees. They will actually, whenever she's on the comb and she stops walking, these bees will immediately turn around and face her. Then they're called her retinue or queen court sometimes. And just, they will check up on her at various times when she's doing her job of laying the eggs. They feed her, groom her. Basically, they do everything for her except to lay the eggs. So she has her own attendant bees that take care of her. After being an attendant bee, a worker will get her first outside job. And that is, wait a minute, let me back up. After being an attendant bee, bee becomes a house bee. The house bees are responsible for tasks like making honey, collecting the pollen that the foragers bring in, putting it in cells, everything that involves packing the cells, building wax, maintaining the resources in the hive. You can see here in the first picture on the left, two house bees putting honey in the cells. That's a lot of their main job. They actually are in charge of making the honey. Forager bees will bring in nectar, a sticky syrup that comes from flowers. And the house bees will take it from them and then the house bee that gets it puts it in her honey stomach, which is really more like a pocket than a stomach because it's only used for storage of honey. And in there, she'll mix it up with some enzymes, maybe transfer it around to another bee who will put, add her enzymes. And then eventually one bee puts it in a cell with the enzymes mixed in. And then the house bees will flap their wings so that a current of air goes over the honey and dries it out and then they will cap it with wax. So that's basically how honey is made, and that's a lot of the job of our house bees. The bee's first outside job after that is a guard bee. The guard bees, you'll see them at the entrance of your hive if you have bees. They will, as their name implies, they are in charge of guarding the hive from intruders like us. They will stand there and basically patrol the landing board. Sometimes they will fly out to sting bigger animals or if smaller animals such as other bees, robbing wasp insects are coming in, they will fight them staying on the entrance to the hive. So you can see your guard bees sometimes. I've seen mine fighting with wasp, trying to sting them. They basically just keep the hive, making sure that no foreign bees or other animals come in. They do know which bees belong to their hive because each hive has a special smell of pheromone that belongs only to that hive. So it's like a password. When a new bee tries to come in, the guard bees will make sure that she has the smell of the hive on her. So they keep out all the intruders. The last job that a bee gets, the oldest bees are forager bees. They are in charge of bringing in all of the resources that the hive needs to survive. Outside of the hive, these are the bees you'll see. They have four things that they forage for. Nectar, pollen, water, and sap, which they use to make propolis. Nectar, obviously, 
as I mentioned, is used to make honey. It comes from flowers at the base of the flower. They will bring that back to the hive, transfer it to the house bees. The house bees will use it to make honey. The pollen is also used for food. All animal, bees like humans and all other animals need carbohydrates, sugars, and protein. So they get their sugars, their carbohydrates from nectar, and they get their protein from pollen, both of which come from flowers. So they will bring those two food resources back to the hive. And then also, you might not really think about it, but bees need water to drink and to cool the hive. So that's why bees like swimming pools so much. If you've ever been in a swimming pool and there's bees all around it, the bees like water. They actually go for water that is dirtier or has more chemicals in it, more often than very clean water. I'm not sure exactly why, but there's probably some nutrients in there that they need. So whenever you keep bees, you'll wanna provide water for your bees. Finally, bees will sometimes gather tree sap. They use tree sap from um, resin bearing trees like pine to make a special glue called propolis. They use propolis to seal the hive. They will cover basically the entire inside of the hive box with it, seal any cracks, make sure it's weatherproof. Propolis is also a disinfectant. So that's how they keep their hive germ-free. It's very clean. People sometimes use propolis as medicine because it's a disinfectant. So um, that is what the worker bees gather in the hive. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, pest. These are all pests that beekeepers have to deal with in their hives. Starting with the, probably the least problematic one is the wasp. These are basic garden wasp, um, the larger red ones we get here, I'm not sure exactly what they're called, but they will invade a hive to get the honey. They have a sweet tooth. They always want, wasps always go after sugar, so they'll want to invade the hive for honey. And in the winter, they want to get in the hive because it's warm and they don't want to freeze. So wasps will actually try to enter the hive but as I mentioned before, the guard bees will fight them at the entrance. Usually they will take care of them. While I'm on the subject, I wanna um, mention something that's been in the news recently is the Asian giant, giant hornets were spotted in Washington. Um, this is not a problem for us in Texas right now, but we do need to be a little bit aware if it does happen. Um, it's basically an invasive species from Asia that has come to the United States. There's been, I think, two specimens spotted. And well, the Asian honeybees have defense mechanisms against it, the European honeybees that we usually keep do not. So it may become a problem later. If you, for those of you who are members, I actually covered this in an article recently. So if you need more information, you can go back and read it. Okay, that was a bit of a tangent. So um, moving on, we have the hive beetle here at the bottom, big black beetle, or at least he looks big here. They're actually very small, about the size of a pinhead or so. Um, the hive beetles, are pests that sometimes appear in a hive. They're usually not a very big problem because they, one or two beetles are very easy for the bees to control. The beetles go after the honey and the wax. They will actually lay their eggs in the honey and the larvae will eat 
eat it and that can completely ruin a frame, um, a honeycomb. They'll make the honey orange and slimy and unedible. But <laughs> the bees can usually take care of a small um, number of beetles. They will actually imprison a beetle in the, in the corner of the hive because they cannot chew through or sting through the tough exoskeleton of the beetle. So they will put it in a kind of prison and they will set one or two bees on guard over it and they'll actually feed it small amounts of honey. They're just keeping it prisoner in the hive. I've actually seen this before. It's really pretty cool. They do have, if you get too many beetles, however, they do have beetle traps you can put in, but usually these beetles are not a huge problem for beekeepers, it's just something that we need to be aware of in case they become too much of an issue. In the bottom right corner, there is the wax moth. The wax moth is more of a pest of stored comb and uh, without bees on it than it is of actual hives, though it can get in actual hives if they are small or weak. They, like the beetles, they lay their eggs in the wax. The larvae tunnel through the wax and create webs and will destroy the frame of wax. <clears throat> they can be controlled usually with moth crystals, not moth balls. Mothballs are made of naphthalene and are toxic to bees as well as the moth, so you want to avoid that. But in, when you store your supers, which are the top boxes that honey is stored in, you, and the wax to them, you can put moth crystals. They're made of a different chem chemical called paradichlorobenzene, and those crystals will repel the wax moss, but not be toxic to the bees. So wax moss are usually not a very big problem either because they can be easily controlled and usually they do not attack a beehive. But the, the last pest I'm gonna talk about is probably the biggest problem in beekeeping today is the varroa mite or Varroa destructor is the formal name, which is very apt because they can destroy an entire hive in a matter of weeks. Just like the Asian giant hornets I mentioned a minute ago, Varroa mites were imported or brought back from Asia. They're an invasive species and the European bees do not have developed immunity to Varroa mites. So they can devastate a hive if it's not treated. Um, you can treat with chemicals. There's varying chemicals that beekeepers use in different times of the year, spring and fall usually, different um, treatments to get rid of the, bee, the varroa mites, I mean. And there are a couple of natural methods too, but usually beekeepers will treat. I'm gonna cover that in more detail in just a moment. These mites are blood suckers. And what they do is um, the female mite will enter a cell, lay her eggs, and the mites will attach to the developing bee pupae, which is what a be in a cell that's capped over is called. They will suck the blood of the developing bee and when it emerges, it's weakened. And varroa mites also carry a lot of bacteria, viruses, and they spread other diseases throughout the hive. And they will sometimes attach to adult bees, although that's less common. They say if you see a varroa mite on your bee, your hive is already pretty much got a very bad infestation of mites. So um, the mites can destroy a hive in a matter of a couple of weeks. You'll go in one day and there will be a, 
a lot of bees and then the next there will just be not a lot of bees at all, maybe two or 300. I actually lost a hive that way my first year. I've been beekeeping for three years and the first year we lost one to mites because we didn't treat early enough in the winter. So they have, like I said, varying chemicals. Usually you treat spring or fall. You can do a test for the number of mites um, and treat based on that. Or there's some natural methods. Some people will kill drone brood because Burrow mites prefer drone brood. Drones are bigger and take a little longer to develop than workers. So there's more chance for the mites to develop in the cells alongside them. So they usually go for drone brood first. And that, that's why killing drone brood can sometimes be an effective method. But mainly what you need to know about Varroa mites is they are a huge problem in beekeeping today. And they definitely, beekeepers definitely need to use some method of control. So Morgan, there is a question from someone here on how you treat Varroa mites. So perhaps you could go into more detail on the treatments, the chemical treatments that we use. Okay, sure. There's varying chemicals. But um, basically, they, there's a couple of types. Some of them come in strips that you will put in the hive, leave there for a few weeks, and as the bees brush along the strips of chemical that have chemicals on them, it will kill the mites. But this, the downside to that is it will not kill mites that are already in brood cells. And they mainly, they mainly do stay in the brood cells. So sometimes those do not work as well. But we have used the strips for a couple of years and it's been mainly effective. So um, I think that that's a good method for starting out for hobbyists. Um, there's other chemicals that are fumigants that you'll fumigate the entire hive with it and it will kill for all. There's um, some, and the fumigants will cling onto the bees, cover them in like a powder. And as the bees clean themselves, they will also get a lot of the varroa mites off. So once again, it only pretty much kills the bees on the mites. And there's other varying type of chemicals. And, um, but you mainly treat in spring and fall and the type of chemical you use will depend on the season. And the two natural methods that I'm aware of are, as I mentioned, killing drone brood, which basically you'll take a specialized frame that has slightly bigger cells because the bees will lay drones in the bigger cells. And then after that frame is full of brood, take it out and put it in a freezer to kill the drones and then put it back in the hive. That would take care, that would get rid of any mites that are on the drone brood. The other natural method is queen breeding. A lot of beekeepers, a lot of research is going on on breeding queens that will actively seek out and kill any brood that has the mites on them. They're often called VSH queens, um, and it's, it can be effective, but mainly with a larger number of hives. So a lot of breeding has been going on. Some queens will kill the varroa mites themselves. Those are basically the methods, varying chemicals, strips, or fumigants, killing of drone brood, or breeding specialized queens. Any other questions about varroa mites? Okay, moving on to swarming. Um, this is what you're seeing when you see a big ball of bees like this on a tree or sometimes it can be on a fence or something, this, just this big clump of bees is a swarm and that is how bees will create a new hive. 
when the hive gets too large, there's too many bees packed in one hive, then the bees will start preparations for swarms. Usually it's in Texas, in the warmer regions, it's early to mid spring when they're beginning to enter their peak season. They'll start preparing for swarms. They'll make a bunch of queen cells. Queen cells are larger than worker or drone brood cells. They're specialized cells in which the queens develop and they're fed royal jelly, as I mentioned, to make them develop into queens. They'll have anywhere from around three to sometimes as many as 30 queen cells before they swarm. And then after those cells are built, half of the bees will leave the hive with the old queen. And those half of the bees with the old queen will make a cluster like you're seeing in the picture, sometimes on a fence or um, a tree, just a structure above the ground. And they'll stay in that cluster for a little while, a few hours to a day or so, I believe. And they'll send out some scout bees workers that will act as scouts to try and find a new home, a new place to move in. And the scout bees will come back, they'll tell the other bees, and they will all move in. Sometimes beekeepers will catch swarms, so they artificially put, the, put them in a box, and they will just move into that box because they were already looking for a new home anyway and usually they will stay. So if you see a swarm, the best thing to do is call a beekeeper and they're usually happy to remove it and they will move the bees into a new box. And swarms, you might think they're very um, aggressive then because they're looking for a new home. Actually, they're not. Swarms are very gentle one of the gentlest states of the colony. They are just, on, they have a one track mind, I guess. They are just focused on finding their new colony, their new home. And they've also just eaten a bunch of honey because before they leave, they eat a lot of the honey to, conserve, to um, build up their energy. So a swarm is very gentle. Well, those half the bees have left and they've made a new home. The rest of the bees are left in the hive with a lot of queen cells and no queen. So they'll feed the queen cells until queens, um, until queens emerge, hatch, and those queens will fight to the death and the winner, the one that kills all the other queens, will become the new queen of the hive. So if you're a queen bee during a swarm, it's a hard life. Any questions about swarming or catching swarms? Okay. So now I'm gonna discuss different hive products that we use, use different resources that the bees provide. First and most obvious is honey. You can, you'll harvest your honey from the hive in, if you keep bees in probably July or August, late summer. Um, honey is used both as food and medicine. It is um, good for sore throat, allergies. It will actually help allergies or, this has actually never been proven, but it is said to help allergies a lot if it's local honey, because honey contains small pieces of pollen, small grains of pollen. And if you ingest that, you are ingesting the small amounts of pollen, which is what you have an allergy to from your area, and your body will build up an immunity. So, but if it's, it won't be effective unless it's local honey from the area. Um, Another interesting thing about honey, you can store it as long as you want. It has an unlimited shelf life. It will never spoil 
Honey will crystallize, especially in cold weather. It will form little crystals and become grainy. But the crystallization can be reversed by heating it. And so you can boil a pot of water or get it to almost boiling and then turn off the heat and put the honey in the hot water. That will melt the crystals and return the honey to its normal state and it will be just as good as it was when it was harvested. Actually, I read once they found honey in Egyptian tombs, 3,000 years old, and it's still perfectly edible. I wouldn't eat it if it were me, but the point is honey does not ever spoil. Next thing is wax. The wax forms the structure of the hive. All of the honeycomb is made out of wax. All of the brood comb, they, will, they produce the wax from glands on their stomach and they will knead it up like clay and mold it into different shapes in the hive. So, and humans use the wax for varying things, candles, soap, um, creams, and everything. Usually, um, the wax remains on the frames to put, be put back in the hive. A lot of beekeepers do it that way. And if you choose to harvest wax, you will use a different type of frame. I'll talk about that more later, but sometimes it's about balancing what you want out of a hive. You have to decide if you're going more for harvesting honey or wax and how much wax to take. Propolis is sometimes used by humans, as I mentioned earlier when I was talking about propolis. It's a disinfectant, so you can make it into a solution to use as some people put it in their ears if they have an earache or sometimes pure propolis. I've heard of people chewing it for a toothache. Um, so it's sometimes used for that. Royal jelly. This one is very interesting. Royal jelly, again, that's the food that, that nurse bees produce from glands in their head and they use to feed larvae less than three days old and queens. Now, royal jelly is used in things like shampoo or skin cream. According to people who promote that, it can make your hair sh soft, shiny, you can, and your skin. Kind of similar to the honey and allergies thing. This has never been proven by science. I don't know, it might have some truth to it, or it might just be a kind of fad. Royal jelly is extremely expensive because to collect the royal jelly, you have to kill the queen in the hive, make a hive queenless, and so they will build queen cells and they fill the queen cells with royal jelly. So then you have to go through and kill the queen cells. And the bees just use a lot of energy to build the queen cells. So it takes a very big toll on the hive. And that's why it's such an expensive product and so um, specialized. But that's why you'll see sometimes royal jelly on a product. Last thing people will use from a hive, pollen. This is used basically in the same way honey is used to help allergies, to ingest small amounts of pollen local to your area to build up an immunity. Some people will dissolve some pellets of pollen in water, or some people will use it as a topping for something, a salad or something. It's just supposed to build up that immunity to the allergy to help allergies. Pollen, to gather it from a hive, you need a special pollen trap. And once again, it's about balancing your resources, what you want out of the hive, whether you want to sell it, just give honey away, make things out of wax. It's all a choice starting out, how you want to develop the hive for resources. Last thing is beekeeping equipment. And the hard thing is right now, I cannot show you the equipment. Usually if we were able to meet in person, 
I would have a beehive here to show you and demonstrate the different pieces of equipment. But I don't have that today and I'm just going to hope it works out. Using this slide, I have a picture here, a cute little drawing of a bee with different pieces of equipment. Hopefully this will be able to, uh, I will be able to tell you about the different pieces of equipment using this and other tools and things that beekeepers will use. First of all, um, protective clothing. You usually see beekeepers in a white suit, white canvas suit and veil for beekeeping. The amount of protective equipment you choose to wear is really up to your individual comfort and the temperament of the hive. Some hives have a different temperament. Some breeds of bees will be more defensive than others. You just have to know your hive and know your own comfort level. Basically, there's several different pieces of protective equipment. You'll have the suit itself, which, is, which can be a pair of canvas coveralls or a jacket, that, a canvas jacket, sometimes canvas pants. And you, you can, some beekeepers wear that. Some will just wear jeans and a long sleeved denim or other heavy shirt. The point is to keep your legs covered and your arms covered with a thick fabric that bees cannot sting through, like canvas or denim. Um, next, you'll usually have a pair of gloves. They make special beekeeping gloves. They are gauntlets. They go up past the elbow, made of canvas, also so the bees can't sting, and leather on the hands. Some beekeepers will wear that. Some beekeepers prefer plastic gloves, like the medical kind, or no gloves at all. Once again, it depends on comfort level and hive temperament. And then obviously boots or shoes that you can close the legs of the pants around the shoes. Usually I wear boots or you can wear tennis shoes with um, straps. They will make tie straps for around the ankles so that the bees cannot go, crawl down your boot or up your pants. So, but the most important piece of beekeeping equipment, of protective equipment, is a veil. There's a few different styles. They usually come with a hat and the veil goes over the hat. Sometimes you'll have strings that tie around your waist. Sometimes there will be a jacket that the veil zips onto the jacket. And you never really want to go near an open hive or work a hive without a veil, especially as a beginner, but even I would say to more experienced beekeepers, it's really not a good idea to go without a veil. Um, the, sometimes beekeepers on YouTube do it, but I don't recommend it. Stings on the face, ears, nose, or lips, very painful areas, very sensitive. Also, bees will usually go for the head and face more than any part of the body because they can sense the carbon dioxide coming off of your breath. It's like a homing beacon that tells them where you are, so they will usually fly straight for the face. And that's why a veil is very important. Um, a couple of tools are important for working bees. A, a bee smoker, I'm sure you've seen bee capers with a smoker before. It's just a metal cylinder with a lid and you light a fire in the bottom, pump the bellows and it will create smoke. That calms the bees down, making them a little easier to work with. And the reason, there's two reasons that smoke calms bees down. First of all, they, bees produce an alarm pheromone, a smell, when they feel threatened and the smell of the smoke will mask that alarm pheromone so they can't smell it as much and they will be less likely to attack. The other reason is that sometimes when bees smell smoke, they will think that there's a fire near the hive, so they will ingest a lot of honey 
to conserve their stores to protect their honey. And so then they become sluggish and slow, like we do after we eat a big lunch. And they will be, less of them will fly out of the hive to defend it. So the smoker is used to calm the bees down. There's another tool and that is, it's called a hive tool. It's a metal bar with a hook on one end, a slight hook and a scraper on the other. It's used for various purposes. Um, you have to break a propolis seal every time you open the hive. So the hive tool kind of lifts up the lid, breaks that propolis seal, lifts up the frames, which are also sealed down with propolis. Sometimes you can use it to scrape propolis or excess wax off of your frames. Basically just an all purpose tool for working with the hive itself. Now we're gonna get to the parts of an actual beehive. Well, you see in the picture in the cartoon, here is a Langstroth hive. It's the type of hive that most beekeepers use at most large scale and even most hobbyist beekeepers. Um, and there's several parts starting from the bottom. We have the bottom board here. It's just uh, the board that the hive rests on and it has a slot for the entrance so that when the box sits on top of it, the bees can fly in and out. Then on the bottom we have the brood box or brood nest. This is the lowest box. There will be one or sometimes two brood nests, if, depending on the size of the hive. And the bees will use those frames to lay all of their eggs, raise their larvae. They will also put some honey in it, but mainly it's used to by beekeepers to regulate their brood in those box in that box or multiple boxes. And in the middle here, between the brood nest and the other boxes, they'll put something called a queen excluder. Just gonna imagine it's here in this not very detailed drawing. It's basically a metal grid with slots that the worker bees, the smaller worker bees can fit through it but drones and queens are too large. It's called a queen excluder because it excludes the queen from going up into the upper boxes, which are called supers. That way, the brood is kept in the brood nest and the top boxes are used to store honey. And so that's why the frames are exclusively honey and there are not eggs. As mentioned, these top boxes, they'll usually be smaller than the lower box. It, it depends on preference, whether you use medium sized boxes or larger boxes for the supers. It really depends, but most of the time they're smaller than the brood box. And these are the boxes that the bees will use to store their honey so that the beekeepers can extract the honey. As mentioned, the queen cannot lay eggs in the upper boxes, so the bees will use it to put their honey in. They'll make some honey in the lower box, the brood box, but all of their excess, they will put in those top boxes. Sometimes there will be anywhere from one to four supers on a hive, sometimes more, but most hives usually stay around four. And the bees will cap the, will make the honey in there, cap it up, and then the beekeeper will take, take those boxes off and extract the honey. So the other parts to the hive, there's gonna be two lids, a inner cover, and an outer cover or telescoping lid. This is kind of similar to a house where you will have a ceiling and then a space in between, like the attic, and then a roof over it that covers everything. So there's just, um, that space is left for ventilation. So you'll have the, and the outer cover usually has tin on it to protect from weather. 
So you'll have the inner and the outer cover on top of it. Inside the boxes, there are frames. Here, here's a frame. It's basically a um, rectangle of bordered by wood. And in the middle, there is plastic, a plastic sheet called foundation usually. And it will have the imprint like, like honeycomb cells, hexagonal imprints. And the foundation is just the base on which the bees will build the comb. They can build it naturally without foundation in the perfect hexagon shapes, but putting the piece of plastic in there, the foundation, just helps them draw the wax out quick, more quickly and makes it easier for the beekeeper. The frames can easily be pulled out of the hive. There's usually 10 per box. Um, sometimes smaller hives will have eight per box, downsized, but the standard size is 10 frames per box. And so you'll have deeper frames in the larger boxes, shallower frames in the smaller boxes. And you can just take the frames in and out and um, turn them over, look at the comb, and flip them over, look at, at the other side of the comb, easily man manipulate them, move them around the hive. And so those are the main area where the bees live will be on these frames. And <coughs> um, that is how the beekeepers will actually inspect the hive. Before frames were invented, it was very difficult to go in and inspect a hive, see how it's doing, study its biology whenever, without killing the hive. Those are basically all the hive parts. Um, I hope that made sense. It's, as I said, a little difficult over Zoom, but um, hopefully, Hopefully I was able to explain how the dip hive parts go together. And now I'm gonna open this up for any questions for the rest of our time and just um, answer anything you can ask. So, Dad, do we have any questions? Yes, there's one question um, in here from Pete Eubanks. Uh, the question is, is that uh, he installed a nuke nine days ago and he placed three brand new frames in there with the nuke. I'm assuming he means it's a five frame nuke um, and, uh, and a one gallon frame feeder. Um, he did his first inspection on Saturday and he did not find the queen and he saw some cat brood and a lot of nectar and honey. And, and he's asking basically how long does it take for the uh, new new frames to be waxed out and should you be worried that you not see eggs or pupa or anything like that? Well, how long does it take to build the wax? It really depends on how big your nuke is when it's installed or, and um, how, how healthy it is, just different factors, but usually in my experience, it takes a couple of weeks or so for them to start really building a lot of wax on the new frames. They will stick to the old frames for a little while, a couple of weeks. They are usually kind of disorientated for a few days. They don't know where they are. They've just been moved, put in a new box. And um, so it'll take a couple of weeks or so as far as brood, I think you just, you'll want to give your queen a little bit of time just to get settled. A couple of days, you probably shouldn't be worried if there's not a lot of brood. And the eggs were, the thing about spotting brood, if you cannot spot the queen, you can look for eggs. Bees remain eggs for three days. So if you see these tiny little eggs, they're kind of hard to spot in the bottom of the cells then you know that there has been a queen in that hive within the last three days and she has laid eggs. It may take a while for them to fill out a brood pattern. Um, 
usually they'll start laying in the old frames before they build wax on the new frame. So maybe it'll take a few days and then you might start seeing some larvae or some brood. And then after that, you might start seeing them building wax or at the same time. Capped brood mixed in with lots of nectar or honey. Yes, I believe that is normal for a new nuke. I think if you don't see brood in a couple of weeks to a month, you should begin to be worried. But for now, um, as long as there's some healthy brood, maybe some eggs or larvae, and enough resources, and they're beginning to build wax after a little while, then your nuke is probably doing well. Is burr comb useful for something after I scrape it off the frames? Yes. Basically, um, wax, anything you can do with wax, you can use the burr comb for. For anyone who doesn't know, burr comb is excess comb that bees will build outside of the frames if there is too much space between the frames or sometimes they'll build it um, on the edges of the hive or if you have a feeder, they'll build burr comb in the feeder. It's just these excess pieces of combs. You can scrape them off, store them in a container of some kind, plastic container, and next time you make something with wax, if you decide to do a project with wax, you can use that burr comb. So yes, burr comb is very useful, unless it's usually very clean because it's newer comb. So it's actually very useful. What is the best way to ventilate a hive for summer? Um, just prop the lid up. Uh, we do small wood blocks, um, like a square block of wood, small piece, and just, you'll have the inner cover and so you can put the wood blocks on all four corners of the inside cover and then set the outer cover on top of them. Or sometimes you can use small sticks, just kind of set the lid back a little bit. There's a few ways to do it, but basically just prop the lid up usually works. Bees do a lot of ventilation themselves. They'll fan the hive with their wings, create a current of air. So but it gets very hot in Texas, so you probably do need to prop the lid up a little bit. Just anything you can find, rocks, wood, sticks, that will lift that outer lid up a small bit. It doesn't need much, maybe a half an inch or so. What is going on when the bees only stay on the inside three frames? Um, usually, that means that they are not, do, that they are just not getting to the outside frames yet. The queen starts and the queen and the bees building wax start <coughs> in the middle and they build outwards in a kind of football shape and start, they build out the middle frames completely first and then they start building out the outer edge. So if your bees are staying in three frames, they probably have enough room. You don't need to put another box. It may be a newer hive or a hive that's beginning to be weakened. They probably don't have enough bees yet to um, maintain all of the frames or they just haven't gotten there yet. So if it's an old hive that's weakening, it's probably something to worry about. If it's a new hive that's just getting started, it's not really anything to worry about. Um, we added a super on the brood box, but left some burr comb on the tops of the frames of the brood box. Do we need to worry about having left that? We scraped it off on a few hives, but left it on one. No, mainly, um, the reason you would scrape it off is your own convenience. It might make the lid difficult to close, or you just don't want them in that. I've actually seen old burr comb, the bees laying in old burr comb, and it, it's perfectly fine. It's just as good comb as on the frames. It's just not in the neat rows that you want it to be. So no, you don't really need to worry about scraping it off every time. If I prop it up, will it allow robber bees in through the inner cover? Well, 
if you have a very weak hive, maybe, but only propping the cover up about a half an inch really will not make that much of a difference. They don't, they don't need to guard that. I don't think that robber bees will get in through the inner cover. The thing with the inner cover is it has edges that overlap over the edges of the hive. Um, so when you prop it up, you're just leaving a little ventilation space, but the edges will still cover the hive. So there won't actually be an open part for robber bees to get in. And the bees will still be able to guard the entrance of the hive. So unless you take your cover off completely or push it back a little bit, it will not really let the robber bees in. When are the main nectar flows in North Texas? <coughs> Early spring, like it's probably going on now. It, actually, um, I said early spring, I mean early summer, to late spring to early summer usually. May, June, sometimes in April. We usually have a lot of rain, you know, March, April, or thereabouts. And so after the rain stops, then the flowers will bloom a lot and the nectar flows will really start to pick up. They last probably two, three weeks maybe. Um, and then the bees will finish making all of the honey, sealing it off. And so you'll end up extracting in late summer, July or August. So basically it's going to be um, sp the spring season starts probably in March. By May or June, you'll have a honey flu flow. And by August, you'll be extracting. Doesn't look like there are any other questions? So I guess we are done. Thank you very much for coming. And hopefully once we get back to meeting in person, we will, I will be able to meet you around the club. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.